This morning we come to Genesis chapter 3. I'm going to be giving a uh, two parts sermon. This is part one, and in two weeks will be part two. Uh, I'm really excited to let you know that Jerry Kester will be here next week, who is our superintendent. And I don't know what he's preaching on. I just told him, come, come here and meet the church again. It's been a couple years since we've been here. I'm here and just meet, meet the people and, and, and give the word of God. So, uh, this, th- but this morning I'm preaching on Genesis 3, really focusing upon verse 16. Uh, let's uh, read this story from Genesis 3. I'm going to begin with verse 1 because just to give the context of the story. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. He said, Who told you you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to me, she gave me fruit of the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the, to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all the beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between you, your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain and childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Let's pray. Father, there is so much here that we could be in this story for weeks and weeks in more weeks. But I ask, Lord, that you would reveal what you want to reveal today. Speak to each one of us as we consider your word. Amen. Amen. This morning, uh, in the spirit of competition, considering that the bocce ball tournament is not necessarily not happening, but might happen, it's on the bubble, Considering that, in the spirit of competition, I, I thought we would begin this morning with great competitors in the history of sport. And so we want to begin with this woman. I think we're going to get her uh, picture up on the screen here. This woman. Yep, we begin with this woman. Uh, a couple years ago, I know it was a big surprise, but a couple of years ago, uh, yes, it's true, because of the fire in her eye, the dedication that she had, she and her husband, Craig, and it was really her, won the tournament. They took home the great Kalama Cup trophy. It was an amazing thing. I didn't even know what to say. I was kind of, like, blown away. Uh, she is truly a great competitor in the history of sport. I've seen it in her eyes. Oh, the, but, you know, we have other great competitors in the history of sport. We have this man, Cal Ripken Jr. That's right. I mean, he's somebody who, who actually, he uh, played in more games, like consecutive games, than anyone else in all of Major League, uh, major, uh, baseball league history, Major League Baseball history. Uh, he broke Lou Gehrig's streak of 2,130 games. He went 2,632 games. You know, that's a lot of games in a row that he never missed. Amazing, amazing. In the world of football, uh, I was thinking about great competitors, and we have to go with 
of course, Richard Sherman. Uh, you know about Richard Sherman, you know? He's famous for, I'm the best receiver in the game. When you try me with some sorry receiver like Clack Crabtree, that's the result you're going to get. See, you remember that? Remember that? Yeah, I remember that. Oh, you don't remember that? Many of us remember that. Seahawk fans remember that when, when the Seahawks beat the uh, 49ers. Um, anyway, I just uh, hope you remember that. Then, of course, from basketball, you know, we have the great Michael Jordan, great competitor. Everyone talks about him being a great competitor. But there is another sport that's almost as good as bocce ball. It doesn't quite arrive to bocce ball, but there's another sport. Uh, the world of boxing, uh, it's, a, it's a big sport, you know, it's, it's pretty important. Uh, there, have been, there have been some great competitors in boxing. You know, you have Jack Dempsey, uh, Rocky Marciano. Uh, you have Muhammad Ali. Someone said something about him one time. He's, he said a few things. He did a few things. Uh, uh, but when I think of great competitors in the history of boxing, of course, I'm thinking of, you know, Rocky Balboa, right? But there's someone in the, who fought Balboa who I think actually had more fire, more fire, more fire than anyone that ever fought Balboa. And I think of him as the greatest competitor in the history of sport. And this is Clubber Lang. You remember Clubber Lang? Also known as Mr. T? You know? He was interviewed, he was interviewed one time, and, and the question, was, uh, question, question to, to him was, well, you know, about this coming fight with Balboa. How, how was he going to handle it? How was he going to handle Balboa? Um, Clubber Lang, please comment on how you plan to fight Balboa. Don't need any. Balboa is so predictable, he's stupid. The man comes straight ahead. He's made for me. No, I don't hate Balboa. I pity the fool. And I will destroy any man who tries to take what I got. Uh, what's your prediction for the fight? Prediction? Yes. Pain. Remember that? Remember that line? That great one-letter word? Clever Lang, what's your prediction? Prediction? Yes. Pain. Let's see. Pain. And so this intro is all to go toward the word pain. You like that? You like how I kind of developed that from great history of sport to great competitors of sport all the way to that little word pain? I thought about that. I thought that was fun. You know, pain, pain. Now, pain is a very important word in our biblical text this morning. Very important word. Uh, this morning, I'm going to talk about pain as it relates to women, you see, in uh, Genesis 3.16. Next time I preach, in a couple of weeks, I'll be talking about pain as it relates to men. Okay, so let me ask you, let me ask you this. W what is pain? Uh, you kind of think, oh, that's a silly question, Pastor. Well, let me ask you, what is pain? You see, I think that we know pain because we experience it. What is pain? Well, it's something that hurts. Okay, well, tell me more about that. Now, Webster... Uh, uh, defines pain this way. The physical feeling caused by disease, injury, or something that hurts the body. Ah, that's pretty obvious, you think? He also says mental or emotional suffering. So now we're expanding what pain is. It's not just the body, but it's the, it's the mind. The mental or emotional suffering. Sadness caused by some emotional or mental problem. And then I like this third, third one that's uh, listed. Someone or something that causes trouble or makes you feel annoyed or angry. You see, someone who's kind of like, uh, I don't know if you're not familiar with this word, but the word gadfly, where somebody is just constantly annoying you and bugging you and, you know, this kind of thing. In other words, sometimes we like to say, that, say you know, beh behind people's back, not that I'm encouraging that because we never should. It's not biblical, right? But we'll say, that person is a pain. You ever said that? Yeah, I bet you have. I'll bet you have. Oh, boy. Well, Still, Webster's, for all its, you know, accuracy in terms of defining pain, you know, the reality is, if you hadn't experienced pain in your life, you still wouldn't know what pain is. That's my, that's my suspicion. I have a friend uh, who, long ago, he had, a, had, a, had a, a small child, about five years old, and, he, and this child was, well, he had a, had, a, had a problem. He had a pain in his back. And my friend told me, he said, look, look, it was so funny because he could not describe his pain in his back. What he said is, he says, I have a headache on my back because his parents always had a headache. I don't know why, but his parents always had a headache, so he associated headache with pain. I have a headache on my back. I always thought that was kind of funny. Okay? But again, the point I'm trying to make is that 
It's pain is something we understand because we experience it, right? Or we have experienced it. Without the experience, well, we'd be in trouble. We would. We couldn't relate to what pain is. Now, all this directly relates to what, uh, what we read in our Genesis story, going back to chapter 2. Uh, let's take a look at 2.15 2 through uh, 17 here. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree in the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Now, I am quite confident that when Adam heard this, he had a hard time relating to it. I don't think Adam really understood what death was about. I can see him scratching his head. Hmm, God, what is death? Now, some people think that death is annihilation, right? Someone who dies. A lot of people think that way out there. Well, there's nothing except that this life, you know, when a person dies, you die, you're gone. There's nothing, there's no future. There's just, you just live this life, you're dead, and that's it, and gone. But that's certainly not the biblical view, and that's not what God would tell us. God tells us death is a little bit different. Death actually, um, well, it has a future, if you will, right? In other words, people's lives go on and on and on. In other words, at least they experience some sort of existence forever. That's what the Bible teaches. Uh, so what is death? Death is actually more accurately defined this way. Death is that moment in time when you begin to experience loss in your spirit. Experience loss in your spirit. Why? Because you have a broken relationship with God. But it's also not only a loss in your spirit, it's also a loss in your soul, the, the mental and emotional, psychological part of life. It's a loss in your soul because you're not in a meaningful relationship with others, right? So there's a, there's a loss in your relationship with God. There's a loss in your relationship with others. But death is also a loss in your own body because your own body begins to break down. That's where pain and aches kind of creep in. I know I, they tell me that when you get older, you start getting aches and pains. I, I don't know. I, I don't know. I have, it's not like I've experienced that yet or anything, right? Because, you know, I guess at my age, I'm still young. Mm, but no, actually, I f feel it all the time. And I suspect that many in this room have felt a few aches and pains in your life. So, so really, death is a loss in all the, the whole person, in the spirit, in the soul, and the body. That death is really pretty encompassing. It's a big thing, right? So, so my point up to, this point, at the, up to this time is that death to Adam and to the woman, you see, the first woman, was a significant unknown, okay, um, and pain, pain as a part of death, was an unknown as well because it requires experience to fully understand it. Uh, they would really have to take it on faith. which I, I guess God was looking for that, wasn't he? Yeah, in the day you shall eat of it, you shall surely die. I, I do wonder what was going on, th on through Adam and, and Adam's mind and, and the woman's mind. I do wonder that, and I hope you wonder that too. Um, well, I, you know the story. We read the story a little bit earlier. And I opened the message. We read the story, and, and uh, verses 1 through 8 essentially tell us the story. The woman was tempted. She was tempted by the serpent. She ate. She gave some to her husband. He ate. And the Bible tells us they died. They died a death in spirit, soul, and eventually they died in their own bodies. So now today we get to look at the consequences of sin. And what, is this, what does this look like? Life's never been the same, you see, after that story in Genesis 3. So that brings us to Genesis 3, 14 through 19. And I'm only going to preach this morning through 14 through 16, specifically going to focus more on verse 16 and verses 14 and 15. But I do have to touch upon verses 14 and 15. So looking at verse 14, we read this. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. This 
essentially is about the significance of sin. This isn't really so much about snakes. We can talk about that if we want. But the real thing about this verse here is the significance of sin. Sin brings the serpent down low. Right? Sin brings the serpent really low. There's a downward motion for sin. Anytime that you sin, you, you, the sin tells you, oh, 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 you know what? If you do this thing, then, then you are going to be like God, or you're going to feel good, or you're going to have this wonderful experience. It, 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 sin tells us that it's going to take us higher and higher and higher. Isn't that what people say when they do drugs? They're going to get high, right? Sin takes us higher, higher, higher. That's kind of the idea. That's the lie. That's the deception. But in reality, sin actually brings us down low. Low, low, low. Even to the dust of the earth. That's what sin is. That's what sin does to us. That's really the most important part of verse 14, understanding that concept. That sin is deceitful, brings us down low. Now let's look at verse 15 here. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Uh, Clearly we have here in verse 15 a a picture of the deceiver. A picture of Satan who is the deceiver. A picture of sin incarnate, if you will. Uh, Satan is the great sinner, if you will. Satan is really the, the great... Uh, um, one who rebels. He's the one who rebels. In other words, what we really have here is a cosmic battle between the rebellious order and God himself. You know, what we're going to see, of course, throughout Scripture is that there is a battle between good and evil, right? Good and evil. But here's, here's, um, here's what I want, before I get into any details here, here's what I want you to see and I want you to understand. I've got to say this is that this is not a dualism. In other words, a lot of people walk around and think, well, you know, Satan is as strong as God, and God is as strong as Satan, and something happened, you know, where, I mean, God won, but whew, barely won. Oh, got lucky, I guess, maybe. Whew, oh, the good barely won, but I don't know. That bad's pretty good, pretty strong stuff. And you know, our culture would like to tell us that that bad is just as strong as good. Or, or, you know, this kind of thing. They'd like to go the Star Wars approach, right? which is actually Star Wars is taken from uh, an Eastern religion where yin and yang, this kind of thing, where there's an, e- there's an equaling out of good and evil, of, of, of black and white and this kind of thing. But it's not true. It's not true. The biblical view is that, is that the rebellious order, the world of sin, is lost, it's weak, it's pathetic, you see, because God... It's not even really, it's maybe, there may be a battle going on there. There has been a battle, of course. But the reality is God is so much bigger. That's really important for us to understand that as Christians. Now, it says here, it says that he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. And I've thought about this many times. You know, why heel and why head? Why heel? That's just such a strange statement, particularly in light of the fact that this is clearly talking about, as we as Christians believe, the church has taught this for 2,000 years, that this is really a reference to Jesus Christ, right? The he will bruise your head, this kind of thing. Who's the he there in that line? Well, it's Jesus, you see. Um, and you shall bruise his heel. Well, that's really Satan, okay? But why heel? Well, think about it. Just, it carries forward from the fact that, you know, uh, the fact that, uh, that here you have the serpent is brought down low, And it's on the ground, right? Well, the opportunity for the serpent to attack the man is really down low. So it makes sense. It just carries forward that that we have this image of of this uh, snake or the serpent being able to bruise one's heel. It's carried forward in in a larger way throughout uh, Scripture in that Jesus is definitely injured uh, by the enemy. But then why head? Well, head because, of course, this is about the fact that the man is still upright, right? And we have the opportunity to, using the image of the, of the serpent, who's now this slithering snake, we have this opportunity to crush the head. Uh, it speaks of humanity, and particularly, of course, of Jesus Christ. That Jesus wins the battle, you see. 
He will crush your head. He will defeat you, and your very nature is going to be, you know, you stand no chance before Jesus Christ. So this is what this is about. Okay, that's probably enough on that verse, okay? Because I, what I want to really do in this message, the remaining time I have, is talk about verse 16. Verse 16 relates directly to half of us today. Actually, it relates to all of us because the fact that it relates to women means it relates to men too, right? Because whatever is, you know, whatever the women in our relationships are experiencing, it affects us as men too, big time, right? I don't know. I, I look around, and it's like I'm blown away by the fact that, you know, all right, I have a mother, and she is just the best person ever, and she loves me, but you know what? You know what? Sometimes it's like, okay, Mom, it's enough, it's enough. I have a wife, right? There's another, these are the pe- important people in my life, right? They're women. I've got a wife, right? And she's just, she's beautiful, she's great. Oh, best person ever. But there are times when she kind of like, well, okay, Christy, you know, let me watch the ball game, right? I mean, you know. And then guess what? God just, God thought, you know what? Having a mom and a, and a wife is not enough. You've got to have a couple of daughters, right? So I've got these two daughters. The women in my life just control me. You know, my daughter Heidi's always telling me what to do. You know, she's always telling me what to do. Dad, I don't like what you're wearing. Dad, you need to change your clothes. Dad, you that stuff. Okay, the mic's still working? Good. The mic's, okay, so, so what happens to women is really important to men. Okay, so, so this, this verse is about the new reality uh, given to women. Now, if you think about it, prior to the fall in Genesis 3, we're, told, we're not told a whole lot about a woman's life, the, the woman's life. But we are, all to, but we are told uh, what we need to know about the woman and her significance. We're told, first of all, that she is the very fruit of a unique bonding and that she experiences unique bonding in her relationship with the man. So looking at verses 21 to 24 of chapter 2, let's look at this again. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he, was, while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up it, uh, its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. See, unique fruit. She's a very unique creation, you see, taken from the man's rib. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. And she shall be called woman. He's not naming her, as I said last week. He's not naming her, but he's referencing what or who she is. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and will fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. In other words, woman is like the greatest creation ever. And the man certainly thinks so, and the man better thinks so, and the man still better thinks so. Right? If he wants to stay married, if he wants a good relationship with his mom and maybe his grandmother, who knows, right? And his daughters, you see, you got to think they're great, and they are great, and so forth. I can't wait to talk about this with the men on Friday morning, you know? Anyway. Uh, <laughs> okay. But what this, what this really means, this passage really means in chapter 2 here that I just read, is that it, it's really talking about the fact that the woman was a whole person. Right? She was complete. She is totally satisfied with the very goodness of life. Okay? Now, that's one thing and probably multiple things that we're told about, about the woman before, before the fall. But we're told more in the passages before the fall. We're told, uh, we're told this. In verse, 20, verse 25 of chapter 2, we're told that she, and the man too, but we're told that she is exposed, actually the word is naked, and yet she's not ashamed. She's unashamed. And the man and the wife were both naked and were not ashamed. This means that she had no fear of rejection. Uh, It's not like God was going to change his mind one day about what he made. It's not like the man was going to go, whoa, you know, I mean, whoa, I wanted something better. It's not like that. No, no, she was clearly super duper beautiful, you see. She was the person to be valued above all creation. And although her very existence was a gift, she also, I mean, in this, in this great gift, she also was made in the image of God, right? 
So she was worthy of adoration. She was a gift, but she was worthy of adoration because she's made in the image of God. And guess what? Any, anything, anyone who's made in the image of God is worthy of adoration. Not in the sense that God himself is, but in the sense of, whoa, value, 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 value. Very, very important person. Okay, now there's another thing that we can point out about the woman before, before uh, the fall. Uh, she was a most important work because she was Adam's helper. And we, and we talked about this a little bit last week. She was Adam's helper. We're told in verse 18 of chapter 2, Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. And, and like I said last week, she was a helper by being present, not by getting more work done in the garden. Oh, come on, help me. Help me sow these seeds. Help me, you know, uh, harvest, harvest these peppers or whatever. You know, the funny thing is this, this week, I, I grew some peppers, not just this week, but we had some peppers in our garden, right? And I'm trying to live out this Adam thing, I guess. Anyway, we have this garden, and Christy volunteered. She volunteered. Make sure you know she volunteered. She volunteered to take peppers. She took up 22 of them, I think. Take peppers out of her garden. And no, there was more than 22. She had 22 bags when she was done. But anyway, she took out all these peppers out of her garden, and she spent, I don't know how long, but she spent a long time cutting them up into small, small pieces because if you can just put them in the freezer and use them for soup later. Well, she's a helper, right? Just ask her about it because for the next day, her hand was on fire fire i didn't know you could cut peppers and the, the oil from the peppers will get on your hand and you'll just burn like crazy she was in pain she couldn't even sleep very well at night it's crazy anyway she's a great helper but that's not really the helper we're talking about the helper we're talking about is the one who's present she's a helper because she was there for the man you see um took, meeting his solitude or taking his solitude his loneliness really Taking his loneliness away. Then there's one more thing i got to say about the woman. Well, see, there's a lot more here than we thought. There's one more thing I want to say, and that is that she is given the God job of filling the world. Now, I understand that it takes two, but nevertheless, she's given the God job. Remember in verses 1, chapter 128, verses 28, God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Now, it does take two, but I've got to tell you that the woman has got the primary role. I've seen it. I know. I was there, you see, when my kids were born. And boy, did I work hard. Not really. Christy did the work, all right? So the woman has this God role, if you will, of filling the earth, because that's God's whole intention. That's, God's, that's still God's intention, by the way to fill the earth with his presence, to fill the earth with his image through the church. So the woman had it pretty good. The woman had a life without death. She had a life without pain. She had a life full of significance. But we know what happened. That's what the fall's about, right? She entertained the temptation, and she ate. <sighs> oh, boy. She sinned. And there's enormous, I mean enormous consequences from sin. To the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. In other words, enter Clubber Lang. Enter Mr. T. Mr. T shows up now. Come on. You're getting in the ring. I pity the fool who gets in the ring with me, right? Well, guess what? He's hitting the woman. Right? I mean, isn't that right? Pain is coming upon the woman now in a major way. And I tell you what, if it wasn't for Jesus, she would be utterly knocked out. I guess that means Jesus is the ultimate fighter in the ring, doesn't it? But this is what's going on. Pain, and I mean, I've heard about this pain. I've seen this pain. I've seen this pain in childbirth. My wife gave birth to, I'll never forget the second one who was born, Heidi. Boy, that was a tough, tough 
birth. I mean, 36 hours of, of tribulation. And the doctors messed up because she didn't get the medication she really needed there near the end. It was tough. It was bad. The pain. I never forget her crying out for her daddy. You know, it was awful. And she said, had some mean words for a doctor. That words I cannot repeat. Okay? It's true. It's true. It's true. Anyway, the Hebrew word, if you're interested in any biblical scholars out there, that word is hisapon uh, for pain, and, and uh, it's really something else. Now, the meaningful work that God intended now becomes. Uh, a little bit questionable. At least it comes with a very deep personal price. She's actually at the risk of dying. For many women have died in childbirth. And she begins to wonder, whose idea was this anyway? Well, the reality is it was her idea to sin. Well, it was really the serpent's, but she gave in to it. So she's responsible. But that's not the only pain that she has to deal with. She has to deal with another kind of pain, a very deep pain, and that's the pain in her relationship with her husband. Her relationship with her husband was a unique place of bonding. It was a great blessing. Now it becomes unique frustration. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband. He's going to go one way. You're going to go another way. You're going to have different desires. You're going to go other ways. At times you're going to do this. It'll be contrary to your husband, you see. But he shall rule over you. You will not win. Now, this is really important, very important in this church, actually throughout the Christendom, if you will, if I wish I could get this message out throughout the Christian world, this is super important. Guess what? This is not a description of the Christian life. How many Christians have blown this one? Well, I'm supposed to rule over my wife. No, you're not. If you want to be a sinner, go ahead. You see, despite what Paul says in, in, his, in his letters, that's a whole nother, that's another issue. Don't have time to deal with that today, specifically. It would take forever. But, the, but do not take this verse as a description of the life that God ordains. No, it is not the life that God ordains. This is the life that is the result of sin. Do you want to live in that world? I don't want to live in that world, you see. Um, this is a description of the fallen life. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband. In other words, there will be a natural, a natural resistance to mutual love and mutual respect. Husbands and wives, without a large measure of grace, they're not going to be able to get together. They're not going to be able to stay together. Guess what? They're going to be divorced. See a little of that in our culture? You see? Even the best marriages without God's grace end up being two lonely people because inside they're not connecting because we are spiritual beings and the only way that we can, can connect spiritually in the deepest part of our lives with another person is with the help of god god gives us his spirit and in our spirit we are able to open up in new ways okay and then i gotta have this to say it's not in verse 316 but it's about the fall on the woman the woman's sense of freedom or sense of acceptance and value by the man is replaced with this attitude. What have you done for me lately? What have you done for me lately? Woman, have you cleaned the dishes? Woman, have you gotten me my paper? Today, it's, I guess it's the cell phone. What have you done for me lately? Woman, have you given me some children? Right? I know this is hurtful, but this is the reality, the consequence of sin. Remember in verse 20 of chapter 3, the man called his wife's name Eve. Why? Because she was the mother of all living. In other words, she is valued upon what she does. She produces children. She's acceptable. She doesn't produce children. Eh, not so much. And of course we know, because God has a sense of humor, I think, that oftentimes it's not the woman's fault, right? That there is no fault. It's way more complex. But the man decides that the woman's value is based upon what she does. Let me tell you, when God made a woman, it's because of who she is. The fact that she simply is a woman. 
and his presence that she has enormous, unspeakable, an inexpressible value. You see. Welcome to our world, women. <laughs> Welcome. Are you having fun with this? Pain in childbirth, pain in your relationship with your husband, you're valued based upon what you do. So what's the good news, Pastor? <laughs> Isn't there some good news here? Well, of course there's good news. We're New Testament people. God has done a new thing in Jesus Christ. But notice, again, that the childbirth pain was not God's plan. It, she, and she is not cursed. I've got to say that. It's the result of sin. Okay, this kind of thing. Right. Here's, the good, here's where the good news comes from. Woman, women, your brokenness, and men who live through this, your brokenness is meant to tell you something. It's meant to tell you that you need a Savior. God wants you to recover from <clears throat> this naked and ashamed existence and to rediscover, to revisit the naked and unashamed life. To be naked before God is to be transparent, is to be open, is to be able to be met and known by him as well as your husband. Forgiveness from sin is the crucial issue, right? Forgiveness of sin. If you forgive, you see, or if you ask for forgiveness, he will gladly forgive you, right? It is a, it's an incredible cost of, uh, here because we're talking about Jesus on the cross. But God has given us the opportunity to, in Jesus, to be forgiven and to have our relationships mended and to be able to discover a newness of life, a great life. And that's really God's invitation to you. Um, I will... I'll leave you with this word today, and, and we're going to finish the message. Remember this. Remember that it's a woman who's the first one who meets Jesus in the garden. The garden, remember? She thought that, she, in John chapter 20, she thought that Jesus was the gardener. There's a reason for that. Oh. And he reveals himself to Mary. Magdalene, who is a broken, broken person. That's because, women, Jesus loves you. You are still, in Jesus, the greatest of all creatures. Men are just trying to keep up with you. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we couldn't spend a whole lot of time on the restoration part of this message, but Lord, uh, we know that that is your heart. I just pray for all the women in this congregation that they, would, that they would begin to be healed of all that stuff they've had to deal with. God, would you heal them so that not only would they be healed, but that we, us men, would be healed. We need them to be whole and complete people. And we need to t they need to hear, and we need to tell them that we love them. So God, bless all the women in our church.